Well, <laughs> grab your copy of God's Word and turn with me to John chapter 5. I would just like to add my welcome to Tim's um, a moment ago. We're so glad that you're able to join us if this is your first time here. My name is Albert, one of the pastors here, and it's a privilege to be able to open up God's Word with uh, many of you on a week-by-week basis. I would like to welcome uh, everyone that's watching online. I know as I look across the room, there are many of you guys that are at your couch or you're somewhere else uh, for various reasons, whether sickness or vacation. Know that we miss you. Know that we love you. We can't wait to be back in the same room with you and worship our King uh, together. Uh, I want to add one note to what Tim uh, mentioned. We do have a membership class. So he said a membership meeting. I just wanted to clarify We have a membership class coming up in the beginning of October. And so if you're looking to join membership, if you're looking to learn more about the church, that'll be a class you want to sign up for. And so if you have any questions about that, feel free to find me or Tim after the service and we will walk you through some of those things. So John chapter five is where we're going to be Uh, here at Mission Bible Church. We take God's word seriously and we respect and we honor God's word. So let's do this as a church. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Uh, What we do as a church is we congregationally read the scriptures. I know there's many of you guys that are new. And what that simply looks like is we read the passage we're going to study together before we walk through it. And so John chapter 5, verse 39 through 47 will be our target area of study this week. And if you do not have an NASB 95, the verses will be on the side screens that you can look at. And so we'll read along together. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 39. Let's read together, church. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe? When you receive the glory from one another and do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. Do not think that I will accuse you before the father. The one who accuses you is Moses in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Thus concludes the reading of God's word. Church, you can be seated. As you are, let's pray one more time for our time in God's word. Father, we need you today. Holy Spirit, we need your help. Holy Spirit, we need you to allow us to see the words and to savor the Savior as a result of it. We thank you for the fact that today we get to do what the church has done for thousands of years, and that is to gather corporately to sing songs of praise and to worship you sitting under your word and to spend time in fellowship. We thank you, as it's already been mentioned, for the freedom that we have to gather publicly like we do. And Lord, I can feel it. There's many things that, go, that are going on in our hearts and in our minds. I know many people are sick. I know many people had late nights last night. But we ask and pray for your help now that as we turn to what pastors and preachers have done for thousands of years, which is just open up the word, to read the word, to explain the word, and to apply the word. We ask and pray that by your spirit, you would uh, grow us today, renew us today, uh, invigorate us today. May today be a means of further perseverance for those saints who are uh, wobbling and who are struggling. May today be a day where those who are outside of the kingdom of God are brought in by your powerful and strong hand. May today be a day for the Christian who's living faithfully and worshiping boldly. May they be further strengthened and further boldened because of the truths we study. And as we see in the text, may today be a day of purifying our hearts so that we may not look like the world in very specific matters. So grow us today. Give us a greater vision of Christ today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, there are two truths about salvation that run parallel in the scriptures. Two truths. The first one is that God is absolutely sovereign in salvation. 
He's sovereign in salvation. What do we mean by that? Well, what we're saying when we say that he's sovereign in salvation is that if you and I stand here today and say, I am a part of the family of God, I have been born again, I have been made a child of God, what we're acknowledging is that God did a work to save us. That was not a work that we did or a work that we accomplished on our own. God is sovereign in salvation. We're going to see that in John chapter 6 as we get there in the next couple of weeks. Now, while this truth is clearly explained in the scriptures, the other parallel truth running throughout the word of God is this. It's that if a person does not believe, if a person goes on into eternity in hell because of their lack of belief, the blame rests fully upon them. The blame rests upon them. You see, this truth or these truths are hard in our minds to or hard for our minds to wrap our our minds around. These two truths seem to contradict one another. But what we find in the scriptures is that both truths are facts. And the only reason we cannot comprehend is because our minds are limited in what we can take in and understand. And it's this second truth Man's responsibility that we will be considering this morning and even more specifically to draw in a more targeted focus. We're going to be considering and we're going to look at why it's right to say that man is responsible for his unbelief. And so this is the main idea this morning. This is the big idea that's going to be running through this portion of God's word from verse 39 through verse 47. Here's the main idea. Write this down. Man's failure to believe is rooted in his unwillingness to believe. That's the big idea. That's the main idea we're going to see in this text. Man's failure to come to Christ, to worship Christ, to follow Christ, to bow to Christ, to bend their knee to Christ. Man's failure to believe is rooted in his own unwillingness to believe. And as we walk through this text, we're going to see this truth unfold by first looking at the statement of man's unwillingness. Then we're going to move on to the reason behind man's unwillingness. And then we're going to end by looking at the deception that undergirds man's unwillingness. The statement, the reason, and the deception of man's unwillingness to believe. So let's look at number one, the statement of man's unwillingness to believe. Pick it up with me in John chapter 5, verse 39. John chapter 5, verse 39. You search the scriptures, Jesus says, because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. Now, where are we at in this narrative? Where are we at in this story? Well, if you remember, we started a, probably about a month ago in John chapter 5, and we saw Jesus heal a man who could not walk and who was unable to walk for 38 years. 38 years unable to walk, 38 years unable to move, 38 years not having the ability to go and to move wherever he wanted. Jesus heals this man instantaneously, miraculously. And what happens? Rather than rejoicing by those all around, there was a pocket of Jewish leaders that began to question Jesus and were frustrated because he had healed the man on the what? The Sabbath. You see, they had made up their own rules. They had made up their own regulation. They had made up their own standard that says you can't do such and such on the Sabbath. And so Jesus heals this man. And in their minds, he had broken their rules. And that was a no go. That was a no fly when it came to what they had established. And so what begins to happen is Jesus gets in this back and forth where he's establishing his claims to deity. Why can I heal on the Sabbath? Why can I work on the Sabbath? Well, the father works on the Sabbath. Thus, I can work on the Sabbath. And the Jews knew Jesus was saying, guess what? I'm God. I'm deity. I have the same divine prerogative to work on the Sabbath like the father has to work on the Sabbath. This led to the Jews wanting to kill Jesus. They were not only upset, they wanted to put him to death. And Jesus begins to show and bring witnesses to the stand as to why what he says about himself is true. And that's where we pick it up in verse 39. Jesus, as he continues this monologue that began in verse 19 to verse 47, he turns the focus fully on his opponents, the Jewish leaders. 
And he does it by bringing up the foundation that undergirds their religious confidence. And what is that foundation? The scriptures. The scriptures. He's looking at them. He's peering into their eyes and he says, you search the scriptures. This word search, if you want to draw it in your margin, means an intense and diligent and careful study of God's word. These men were not slouches when it came to Bible reading. These men did not allow dust to gather on their Bibles because they allowed it to sit on a shelf for months on end. These men were intently in the word of God. They studied the word of God. They investigated the word of God. These men lived the word of God. In fact, in Jewish culture, most young boys by the age of 12 knew the whole Torah. They had memorized it. They took the word of God very seriously. Now, what undergirded their diligent study of the scriptures? Well, Jesus gives us the answer, and it's linked to that word because... You see it in verse 39? What undergirded their diligent study? Jesus says, you search the scriptures. Why? Because you think that in them you have what? Eternal life. You think that in them you have eternal life. Now, in one way, this motivation to diligently be engaged in the word of God was a good motivation. This was a noble motivation. But in another way, and we're going to see in a moment, this was not good. Their motivation was not good. And in fact, their motivation was misguided. Now, in what ways was it misguided? Well, look back at verse 39 with me. We find that answer by the two words in them. How was their motivation misguided? Jesus says, in them. You see, rather than the scriptures being the means to the end, the Jews viewed the scriptures as the end itself. Translation, their confidence for receiving, being recipients, being the beneficiaries of eternal life rested in their activity of Bible reading, not in the Savior that the Bible pointed them to. In fact, the Mishnah, one of their treasured writings, codifies this and declares their uh, their. Uh, their trust in the word of God to bring them eternal life. Listen to what the Mishnah says. It says the more Torah, what's the Torah? The first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, their treasured writings, the writings of Moses. The, Torah, um, the Mishnah said the more Torah, the more life. If one acquires for himself knowledge of Torah, he has acquired life in the world to come. You see, for the Jews, their confidence rested in their activity and not in Jesus to save them. And this is why Jesus says what he says in verse 39. He says, it is these. What are these? The scriptures. It is these that testify of me. The very scriptures that you pride yourself to constantly be in, that you find your confidence in to be the thing that gives you eternal life. No, the scriptures are the thing that testify about me. And that's where eternal life can be found. Now, why was this the case? You see, when we study the Bible, we want to ask good questions. We want to ask questions like why? Why was this the case? Why was this the reality? How could they be so active in the scriptures, but stiff arm the Savior? Look at verse 40. Jesus tells us why. He says, you are unwilling. That's huge. You are unwilling to come to me so that you may have what? Life. Jesus puts the blame where the blame belongs. Not on the scriptures, not on the Savior, but on them. He says, your unwillingness as a sinner to come to me is the reason why you do not have eternal life. Now, we see this unwillingness to come to the Savior by the sinner in the earliest parts of the Gospel of John. We see it in John chapter 3, verse 19. When Jesus says, or John writes, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness Rather than the light, why? For their deeds were evil. And listen to what it says in verse 20. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light. Why? For fear that his deeds will be exposed. Unwilling, refusing, stiff-arming the Savior. 
We see it again, and we'll see it later in John chapter 8, verse 43. Jesus says, why do you not understand what I am saying? And listen to what he says. It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. That'll preach in a mega church. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And listen to what he says in verse 45. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. There's an unwillingness. There's this a volitional uh, a stiff arming that happens in the heart of the sinner against the Savior. You see, this is a reminder for you and I this morning of how sinful sin is. Sin renders a man and a woman unwilling to come to Christ. Now, we know what the Bible says. We know that man is unable to. We know from one side of the coin, because of sin, because of depravity, they're absolutely unable to move towards God. But what Jesus is focusing on right now is the volitional aspect of a sinner unwilling to come to Christ. Sin is this sinful. This is a reminder of how sin is rendering you and I and men and women outside of Christ unable to long for Christ. And we actually do not want anything to do with him. You see, this helps us to understand why loved ones do not come to Christ when we lovingly and faithfully share the good news of the gospel. We just stand back in awe and say, how do you not want this? How do you not desire this? How do you not change? How do you not cling to Christ? How do you not grab onto the Savior the way that he has changed and transformed my life? Why would you not want this? Jesus says, because they're unwilling. This is the picture of a man or a woman who's been lost in a cave and who's longing for relief or locked in a prison, who's longing for escape. And once the moment of escape happens, once the light cracks in, once the door opens, rather than walking out and being free, they say, you know what, I'm good here. I don't want that. This is the unwillingness of a sinner. Now the question, again, we want to ask questions of the text. The question that we begin to ask is why? Why is the sinner unwilling to come to Christ. You see, you and I understand that when there is unwillingness in the heart, there's a reason why there's unwillingness. There's a reason why we say no. What's the reason? Point number two, we're going to see the reason for man's unwillingness to believe. Jesus moves from the statement of their unwillingness. Now he's going to show us the reason underneath their unwillingness to believe. And this will be very instructive for us today. The reason for man's unwillingness to believe. Look at verse 41. Let's continue to study the text together. Jesus continues. He says, I do not receive glory, or we can say praise. That's the right translation of doxa here. I do not receive glory. I do not receive praise from men. What is Jesus saying right here? He's dealing with motivation. You see, it's probable at this moment that the Jewish leaders in front of him are, are saying, you know, Jesus is just on a high horse right now. He's, he's just tripping right now because we didn't give him the praise that he rightfully deserves. So he's making this a big deal. He's bringing this big conflict because he's just frustrated that he's not receiving from us what he desires. But rather than allow that to gain credence, rather than allow that to stand, Jesus flatlines that thinking right on its face. Jesus shuts down that foolish notion. He says, I don't need man's praise. I'm not pining for man's praise. And in this case, I don't need the praise from you specifically as an unconverted man. Now we wonder, aren't we supposed to be people who give Christ praise? We all know that. That's like one of our main admonitions. We're to glorify the Lord in everything that we do. We're to give him praise. We're to worship him. We're to bow before him. We're to extol him. We're to lift his name up. But what Jesus is saying is, even if that were not to happen, I am not in need of praise. I possess glory myself. You see, one of the other realities is Jesus was also motivated by a greater praise. Why didn't he need man's praise? Because he had a greater praise that he was working towards. 
Turn with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Love the sound of Bibles turning. Such a wonderful sound. John chapter 17. Look at verse 1 through 5 with me. What do I mean by the fact that he was motivated by a greater glory, a greater praise that he was working towards? Listen to what he prays in the high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. Look at verse 1 through 5. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. What hour? The hour for his crucifixion, the hour for his substitutionary death, the hour for him to die in the place of sinners who would believe. The hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. He's working for the glory that comes from the father. He's working from the praise that comes from the Father. Listen to what he says in verse 2. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all men who have given him, or you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. And listen to what he says in verse 5. Now, Father, glorify me together. Give me the praise. Glorify me together with yourself. And then notice the possession with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus is not in need of human praise because he possesses all glory in himself. And that's what he's saying to these Jewish leaders right here. You see, unlike, the Jew, uh, unlike Jesus, though, the Jewish leaders were standing before Christ and they were not after the praise of God. They were not after the worship or the praise of God and the, uh, and the glory of God in the person of Christ, at least not genuinely. Their driving ambition was for something altogether different. And this is very important for us to lock in on here. What was this? Jesus begins to attack their hearts on the very matter. Look at verse 42. What were they after? If they weren't after the, the praise of God, if they weren't after the glory represented in the person of Christ, what were they longing after? Verse 42, he begins to walk us down the pathway to get there. He says, but I know you. Again, this is a full perceptive knowing. This isn't like a, a shallow knowledge. This is, I know you in and out. I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. By saying, I know you, Jesus is drawing a contrast between himself and the Jewish leaders. And the contrast centered around the motivation of love for God. See, despite what they claim, despite what they said, Jesus says, you don't love God. You have no love for God in yourself. Jesus is making it clear, you're not on the side of Yahweh. You're not worshipers of the one true God. In fact, you're in opposition to him. And he continues to drill down into the heart motive of what they're at and getting after in verse 43. He says, I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. How do I know that you do not love God? Well, one, you reject me. This is Jesus again affirming what he said about himself in John chapter 5 verse 19 and John chapter 5 verse 30 where he says, I am in complete unity with God the Father. What he does is what I do. His glory, his honor is my glory and my honor. My works are the works that only God can do. He's again affirming the fact that he is God. While he is the eternal son of God, he is no less God. But not only is their lack of love for God shown in the rejection of Christ, it's also shown in their ready acceptance of false messiahs. Look at the second part of verse 43. It says, if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. He's bringing substantial evidence as to why he can say with clarity that you do not have the love of God in yourself. You reject Christ and you welcome false messiahs. Rather than accept and worship the true Christ who came in humility and operated in perfect unity with the Father, ironically, they rejected him and they embraced those who were self-willed, self-appointed, and full of selfish ambition. Again, he's driving and he's getting to the reason why. And we haven't seen it yet. It's going to be in verse 44. He's getting to the reason why they are unwilling to believe. 
See, what Jesus is telling these Jewish leaders is that true love for God issues in obedience to God. And obedience to God was what these men lacked because they rejected the Savior and they worshipped false messiahs. How did these men become so confused? Well, Jesus now gives us the crystal clear reason why. Look at verse 44. You could call this the apex of this, this section. Verse 44. He says, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? It's a rhetorical question. It's more or less a statement in reality. How can you believe? How is it possible for you to believe? You can't even begin to believe. And why is that? Because you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. It's impossible for you to believe because of your ambition and your drive for self-praise. You see, you see what Jesus just did there? He says you have the same ambition that the false messiahs have. The reason why you reject the true Messiah who comes in humility in the name of the Father is because you welcome false messiahs who essentially bolster the very ambition that you have inside of yourself. The reason why you're so ready to accept false messiahs is because as you pat them on the back, you know you're going to get patted on the back. They possess the same ambition that you have. One commentator put it this way. They speak your same language. Why do prideful people like other prideful people? Because prideful people don't not, do not want to be condemned by a humble person. This is what's happening here. Jesus is saying, you're welcoming these selfish, ambitious guys because you are selfishly ambitious. And this is the very reason why you will not believe. I don't think we've ever thought about this. I was floored as I was studying this text to see this. I've never seen this before. I've never considered this before. That longing for the praise of men, wanting to be lifted up by men is the root for unbelief. I mean, we can't even begin to wrap our minds around that, but that's what Jesus is saying right here. Why don't you come? Why won't you believe? It's because you love the praise of men far too much. And what's interesting is we see an example of this in John chapter 12. Listen to what happens with the Pharisees. Again, this is mind-blowing stuff. I've never considered this. John chapter 12, verse 42. Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, so these are like the elite guys. Many of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him. Why? For fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. Why? For they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. What do we hear Paul write in Galatians chapter 1 verse 10? He says, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? Why? If I were still striving to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. It would be absolutely impossible. Consider what James chapter 4 verse 6 says. God is opposed to the what? Proud. But he gives grace to the humble. God is in opposition to the proud. But grace is received by the humble. This is the reason why in the Sermon on the Mount... Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. I love that text because it gives you, and what you find in the Bible is there's two words for poor. You got the person who's poor, and this is a modern understanding of it, the person who's on the street corner, but has full ability to work and to get a job and to get his life together. That's not the poor that is referred to in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. It's talking about a complete destitute person. A person who is in absolute need. A person that if somebody doesn't come and pick them up, they are not moving anywhere. 
Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Why is praise of men, seeking the praise of men, something that keeps us from unwilling to come to Christ? Because of pride. I mean, this is what is necessary for acceptance of the gospel. Humility. I don't have it together. I haven't figured it out. I haven't done enough. Nor can I. I am in need. I am destitute. I am poor. I am absolutely at my wits end with trying to climb my way up to God. I need your help. See, but as long as we're pursuing the praise of men, we're still living in pride. We're still on the throne. We're still king. We're still seeking to be worshipped. And for us as Christians, this needs to be a reminder. I get so fearful of what I see on social media today with so many Christian leaders. So many Christian leaders. And I didn't know why. There's just something that rises within me when I see a lot of the ways that Christian leaders are constantly retweeting themselves and constantly putting their accolades out there and constantly writing about themselves. And I'm wondering, why does that irk a little bit? Well, I think it's right here. Because the praise of men is the very thing that keeps us from coming to God. And for us as Christians to live for the praise of men is to pick up that very thing that held, held us back from worshiping God and to live in that once again. It should be a great warning. If you ever see me begin to work for the praise of men, please love me enough and call me on the carpet for it. If I ever see one of you guys trying to once again win the praise of men, we got to love one another well enough to say, hey, that's out of line with the word of God and that's out of line with the heart of God. It's the reason why John the Baptist was considered the greatest because he was what? The chief servant. He did not view himself as important. He shed that. He pushed that away. He wanted nothing to do with that. And how powerful can it be for our church if we all possess this same heartbeat? If you and I lived in such a way where we operated in humility, not working for the praise of men to lift ourselves up, but working to fill and to receive the praise of God. And we're constantly trying to say he must increase and I must decrease. This was the reason that man is unwilling to believe. So not only have we seen the statement of man's unwillingness and the reason for man's unwillingness, let's now begin to finish this portion of John chapter 5, and we're going to see the deception behind man's unwillingness to believe. You have the statement, then you have the reason, the longing for the approval of, of man. Which before we get to the deception, just one more thought. Romans chapter 1. What does Romans chapter 1 tell us? Romans chapter 1 says they suppress the truth and unrighteousness and they worship and serve what? The creature rather than the creator. This is a marker of the ungodly, guys. This is that serious. I mean, just think about what Romans 1 is saying. Rather than giving glory and praise and seeking God, we're worshiping fellow humanity and we're seeking their praise. And thus we're constantly on this rat race of elevating one another because we have that same heartbeat to be elevated. Let's go to the deception. Number three. Let's look at verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you before the father. The one who accuses you is Moses in whom you have set your hope. This was a massive rebuke. And the way that Jesus goes about it is masterful. He brings up the very person who was responsible for the writing of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The books of the Bible that the Jews prized so much. Moses was their man. Moses was their guy. In fact, Jewish thought during this time actually believed for some Jews that Moses was presently in heaven interceding on behalf of the Israelites. 
to God. The same way he did at Mount Sinai when they worshipped a false idol. And Moses interceded for them. And the way that he's done it multiple times, they believed that Moses was even interceding at this very time. I mean, Moses was their guy. They had great reverence for Moses. We see this in John chapter 9, verse 28, after Jesus heals the man born blind. And the Jewish leaders are questioning this man. And they accuse him of being disciples of Jesus. And they're trying to undercut that by saying this in John chapter 9, verse 28. They say, you are his disciple. Big deal. Not a big deal. That's not significant. That's small. And then listen to what they say. Contrast. But we are disciples of Moses. Moses was their guy. And this is what makes Jesus' words so shocking. Rather than understanding Moses to be interceding for them, he wants them to understand that Moses is the one that's accusing them right now. Leon Morris says, with one sweep, Jesus not only takes away their Moses, but hurls at them, flings at them the real Moses against them, the one who already condemns them. Now, why does Moses condemn them? Look at verse 46. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote about me. See, apparently, despite their love and their respect for Moses and the writings of Moses, they missed the fact that Moses testified and pointed to the Messiah. Now, Jesus doesn't give us the exact passages. Maybe he's referring to Genesis 3.15, maybe Deuteronomy 18.15, maybe Numbers 24.17. Jesus is not trying to bring all that out. He's just trying to build the point that Moses has written about me. You're the ones who follow Moses, but you're failing to see. But not only did they fail to see the writings, they failed to view the writings of Moses properly. What do I mean by that? Well, what does Galatians 3 and Romans 7 tell us about the law? The law was meant to flatline all hope that you can accomplish your own salvation. So their engagement with Moses, their understanding of Moses was altogether wrong. And then Jesus closes the monologue by saying what he says from a different angle in verse 47. Saying what he said in verse 46 from a different angle, verse 47. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? How will you believe my words? True understanding, true belief in the writings of Moses, Jesus says, leads to true belief in my words and my claims about myself. By the way, the fact that Jesus says, my words, Moses' writings, Moses' writings, my words, this is an affirmation of the trustworthiness and the authority of the Old Testament, and more specifically right here, the first five books of the Bible. This is the reason why when you go to seminary and you're reading things like the documentary hypothesis that are seeking to undercut the writing of Moses, you can turn to a passage like this and say, that's baloney, that's false, these are the very words of God. You see, what we see here is that the heart of man will find a way to justify their unbelief. For the Jew, it was keeping the law of Moses and claiming identity with Moses that they used to justify their unbelief. For the average Joe, for the average Jane, it's the belief that they make, that they make up in their minds that they're a good person. That God is pleased, that God knows their heart. For the cults, It's the made-up set of teachings that claim to be divine but deny all of the scriptures. For the humanists, it's their made-up worldview that excludes God altogether. You see, but no matter which person or group or false religion or false teaching, at the end of the day, it all boils down to this. Man is unwilling to submit to Jesus. See, but while these men were unwilling, and while every other person that goes to hell is unwilling to believe, The good news of the glorious gospel of grace is that you do not have to remain unwilling. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You do not have to remain in a position of being unwilling. You can believe. 
You can believe. How do you move from a spot of being unwilling to a point of belief? You call upon God to do a work. You call upon God to move in your heart. You call upon God to give that dead, stony heart life and blood and a, and a feeling for him that we're going to see in John chapter 6. You ask God to begin to draw you to himself. You ask God to open your eyes to behold who Christ is. You do not have to remain unwilling to believe. You can be saved by calling upon God to move and to transform. And that's what I want to end with this morning. There's a lot of new people here today. Many of you I've never met. I don't know the background. I don't know your walk of life. I don't know how you ended up here. Maybe just simply a friend invited you or maybe you heard about the church. But I just want to tell you that the good news of the gospel is that the unwilling heart that you possess right now can be broken by the power of the gospel. Believe today. Believe that Jesus came and he died in your place. Believe that he was buried and three days later he rose from the grave. Believe that he sits at the right hand of the throne of God, interceding for the saints. Believe that if you place your faith and your trust on him and in him, his blood that he shed covers you and cleanses you from your sins so that as God looks upon you, he's looking upon Christ as you're hidden with him. You can believe today. Call upon the name of Christ today and be saved. For the rest of us this morning, this is another moment like we had last week to just allow appreciation to rise within our hearts. This was us before God moved. I can think about my moments of stiff arming. I don't know if you can. I can think about my moments of saying, no, that whole Christian thing, I don't want anything to do with that. I can think about those moments where I just kind of heard it, came through one ear and out the other because it just wasn't something that I was interested in. All that was was unwillingness to come. But praise be to God that he said that heart of unwillingness, I'm going to make willing today. Praise be to God. This is a moment for us to rejoice. This is what Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, by what the mercies of God present yourself as a living sacrifice. By the mercies of God, what motivates the Christian life? It's remembering and it's reflecting upon the fact that God's mercy moved and he saved. Allow this to be a time where we just reflect upon the mercy of God by taking unwilling hearts that we possess and giving us a willing heart to believe. Let's pray now as we get ready to transition into a time of communion. The reason why we can believe is because of what we're going to reflect upon right now. It's the fact that our Savior came and died. It's the fact that our Savior moved. It's the fact that our Savior left heaven, took on flesh. He lived a perfect, sinless, spotless life. He obediently, actively fulfilled the law. And passively, he received the condemnation that we rightfully deserve. Father, we, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for the fact that in eternity past, in a way that goes beyond our understanding, beyond our comprehension, you chose us. It's what Ephesians 1, verse 1 through 13, and verse 1 through 4 begins to really make clear to us that you determined to love us and to give us a willing heart to believe. You determined to love us and to remove the desire and the ambition for praise of men and to long for the praise that comes from you. As we prepare our hearts for communion now, we ask and pray that what we have studied, what we have considered, what we have meditated upon, what we have seen and heard from you this morning would be ever present in our mind. We turn to communion now in joy, O oh God, because of who you are, because of what you've done, and because of what you gave so that we might be saved.
It's in Jesus' name. Amen.